Hello, I'm Dr Chris Ennis from the University of Teesside in the UK and in this session we're going to look at how the international community can meet the challenge of global climate change. Now looking at these data which I think you've probably seen before, I think we can agree that the global average temperature at the surface of the planet is increasing over recent geological history. So since 1850 on the graph here we can see that temperature up until about 1950 was stable and then began to increase. And the IPCC has this to say about these data, that in fact warming of the climate system is unequivocal and that that warming is very likely to be due to observed increases in anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. So what that means is that the climate system is heating up and that heating is very likely and that has a statistical significance to, uh, to that phrase. The warming is very likely to be due to human activity. So here's the carbon dioxide concentration. You, you'll have seen this before. I regard this as the defining graph of our age, in fact. This is the signal, really, by which modern human civilization shows up ge uh, geologically. Um, as the, now, so yes, yeah, so on this graph, going back into um, 10,000 years ago, we can see the, the world coming out of the last ice age. And there, the carbon dioxide concentration around about 270 ppm uh, starts to increase as we come closer towards the present around six or seven thousand years ago when the ice sheets start to retreat and as the globe warms the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere increases. That increase in carbon dioxide, in carbon dioxide concentration lags behind the temperature and is due to uh, the system warming up, oceans warming up, and carbon dioxide being released from um, from global reservoirs in response to increasing global temperatures. However, as we get closer to the present, we see this dramatic, starting here, this dramatic increase in carbon dioxide concentration from around about 270 ppm to the current uh, situation well in excess of 370, 380 ppm. That is due to the, um, the Industrial Revolution during which period human society learned to, to dig up uh, fossilised hydrocarbons, oxidise them and the carbon dioxide from that oxidation being released to the atmosphere. Um, the fossil hydrocarbons are, of course, hugely important for human industrialization because there's a really cheap, uh, readily accessible, uh, high-density source of energy. Um, however, the thing to really notice about this, not only has the carbon dioxide concentration in the air shot up dramatically, but the rate, if you look at the inset graph there, the rate of increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is also increasing. So it's getting worse faster. Uh, worse, of course, I, I mean because carbon dioxide is a powerful greenhouse gas. So as we release this material into the atmosphere, so the temperature of the global system should respond by increasing. Now here is a, some historic data of, um, of carbon dioxide concentration over geological time. This is going back um, over 600,000 years and you can see that our concentration now which is up here the concentration now is well outside of the geologically local in time the geologically local uh, average or at least the, the, the I don't mean the average actually I mean we are now above the um, the highest levels recorded in recent geological history so the, the upwards excursion of carbon dioxide concentration that has been the result of human industrialization has taken the global system outside the limits of recent geological history. And that's concerning. 
it's in, it's worth before we before we look more deeply at the concern though it is worth looking at the uh, the patterns inside the data in front of us here and you can see the carbon dioxide concentrations go up and down uh, uh, as as geological history advances geological time advances and these rises and and decreases in in concentration are in in sync with the increases and decreases in in global average temperature as the the earth moves into and out of ice ages uh, as the ice ages retreat as the ice retreats the the temperature increases uh, and carbon dioxide is is released and that's a sort of positive feedback in the system but as the ice retreats also the amount of of land that can be become fertile increases and the amount of vegetation and biomass increase and vegetation and biomass draw carbon dioxide down from the atmosphere effectively acting as a negative feedback on what would otherwise be a runaway greenhouse effect so we see that this this nicely balanced global system of positive and negative feedbacks keeps the keeps the carbon dioxide concentration and importantly also the temperature oscillating within a, a, a fairly well defined boundary and it is that upper limit of that fairly well defined boundary that we have exceeded in recent time by rapidly oxidizing his um, fossilized reserves or reservoirs of um, of carbon so we're now well outside the stable band and temperature is starting to respond remember when the temperature increases as the ice age retreats then the carbon dioxide concentration increase follows that and there's something of a time lag similarly as the carbon dioxide concentration increases driven by human um, human fossil reserve oxidation I mean burning fossil fuels right so as we burn fossil fuels we release the carbon dioxide and the temperature increase lags a little bit behind the carbon dioxide increase so the system has some lag in it this increase in carbon dioxide concentration is going to lead to consequences in the global climate system and those consequences are unknown and are potentially very dangerous to human civilization it is possible that the system will be stressed in a non-linear sense and may move to a state that we can't predict suddenly shift into a new climate um, a new climate state so what is the global international community doing about this well here's a timeline that goes back to the uh, the last few years of the 1980s because in 1988 the international community was sufficiently concerned about climate change to form the intergovernmental panel on climate change the IPCC this um, this body really represented the consensus of the majority of internationally active world governments to um, to recognize and understand the threats posed by our, um, our fossil fuel use the increasing in greenhouse gases that result from that and the threat that we face that is climate change the IPCC then was established in 1988 and in 1992 at the at the UN uh, Rio Earth Summit the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was agreed so this was really the instrument the international community devised in order to um, in order to legislate for the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the full knowledge that those emissions were dangerous in that they were causing climate change in 1997 five years later the Kyoto Protocol was formulated this was the mechanism by which the UNFCCC agreement was was formulated into law and became a legally binding um, document for signatories so countries who who agreed with the with the protocol uh, it became legally binding in 2005 in 2007 meanwhile the IPCC had periodically been re releasing reports and in 2007 they released their fourth annual report and the um, 
I suppose the message, the key message coming from AR4, the annual report number four from the IPCC, was that urgent, react, urgent action was required to tackle climate change. So urgent action, not just action, but that this thing had been getting progressively worse and we needed to take urgent action. In 2012, recently, the Kyoto Protocol expired um, and signatories are now no longer bound by Kyoto law and there is currently no well formulated and, and, and internationally agreed upon replacement for the Kyoto Protocol. So there's now no constraint on, and there's no internationally binding constraint on the emissions of greenhouse gases. Meanwhile, of course, the system, the Earth system, was, was responding in the way that it would respond to increasing carbon dioxide concentrations. And the carbon dioxide concentrations in 1990 were around about 354 ppm, parts per million. In uh, 19, rather throughout the 90s, the concentration increased and continued increasing throughout the, uh, the early part of the current century until in, uh, at about the time of the expiration of the Kyoto Protocol, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere well in excess of 390 parts per million. Um, this is, refer this is uh, I suppose, to be contrasted with the pre-industrial concentration of around about 270, 280 parts per million. So we've seen something like a 100 parts per million increase in carbon dioxide concentration, uh, or more or less a third. Uh, an increase of a third over the course of our industrial history. And what you notice about the, the red numbers on this chart here, of course, is not only are they increasing, but in spite of the fact that there is, during the, this horizontal timeline, there is increasing organisation at the global scale between all the powerful governments in the world, despite that organisation to act, that concentration is increasing, and the rate of change of the concentration is also increasing. So the increase in carbon dioxide concentration is exponential in spite of the fact that the world governments are trying to organise themselves to, to reduce the emissions of, of greenhouse gases. So there are two broad responses to the problem of climate change that are available to global governments the first is adaptation, learning to live with the climate change that, that, that will no doubt and certainly befall us, uh, or, and or secondly, the mitigation of, um, of climate change, trying to avoid climate change and its consequences. Now in 2007, the Stern Report was published, and that report outlined the economics of climate change and, and suggested that it was less expensive to prevent climate change than it would be to accept climate change and deal with its consequences. So the Stern report strongly suggested that the cleverest option is mitigation. So avoid climate change, that's the cheaper outcome. If you don't avoid climate change and then accept that climate change will happen, pay for the consequences of climate change, you'll end up paying more than if you attempted to, to mitigate climate change. Seems like a straightforward argument. If you read the Stern Review, it's a big document, it's very complex, it's around economic forecasting and environmental law forecasting. Um, so when I say it seems straightforward, it, it isn't really straightforward. And, and, and this led to fierce argument that some of the some of the assumptions that Stern was making were more or less valid. And um, anyway, whichever way you cut this, whether you, whether you agree with the Stern report or not, it's certainly true to say that there is a certain amount of climate change that is already in the pipeline. Even if we were to completely uh, stop emitting greenhouse gases to the atmosphere as of today, we would still be locked into a certain degree of climate change. Therefore, both of these responses, mitigation and adaptation, are both um, viable and necessary responses to, um, to the issue. So what do we do about it? What can the global community do about 
climate change, given that there is some climate change coming at us, certainly. And the very best we can do is mitigate any additional climate change that's coming at us. Well, to stabilise the concentration of, of greenhouse gases at 550 ppm, we would need to we would need to have emissions by the middle of the century here at, at 2050 have emissions that are no higher than they are today so this vertical axis here is measuring CO2 emissions so to stabilize CO2 at 550 ppm we need to have emissions go up a bit but by mid-century come down to where they are today 550 ppm though is um, is still a lot and at 550 ppm we are expecting to see climate change in excess of 2 degrees C of temperature increase by the end of the century and that is widely understood by um, IPCC scientists to be da a dangerous amount of climate change. More realistic then in terms of avoiding dangerous climate change would be to stabilize the concentration at 450 ppm which means a rather more dramatic decrease in our emissions such that by the middle of the century we are actually far below current global annual emissions. The business as usual scenario though you can be see you can see if we don't do anything about climate change the emissions will carry on on this business as usual line. Now that's very dangerous or is widely believed or widely held by IPC scientists and, and, the, and the international um, climate science community. It's widely held to be likely to lead to a temperature increase of in excess of six degrees C. So the three, I mean there are many options but here are three of them outlined. One is business as usual, don't do anything about climate change, just keep going with our, um, our emissions that will lead to very large temperature increases. Um, try to stabilize at something around 550 ppm, which means by the mid-century, don't get, don't have any more emissions than we have currently. That will lead to an excess of two degrees C, and that's widely understood to be anyway a dangerous level. And by dangerous, what, what's meant is that there is the potential at that temperature increase for the global system to switch into a new state to undergo feedbacks that we can't control and to, to move from what we understand as our stable global climate into a new stable state that we have no power of predicting. So to avoid dangerous climate change or the possibility of dangerous climate change, stabilization at 450 ppm is suggested. How would we do that? Well, Sokolo and Pakala um, a couple of scientists working on this problem have suggested that it is entirely possible for the global community to achieve stabilisation at 450 ppm and that the method for doing that has become um, summarised in, in this diagram on the, on the bottom left of the screen in which there are stabilisation, there is a stabilisation triangle so called. So that's the difference, the stabilisation triangle is the difference between the business as usual curve and the stabilization at 450 ppm curve. Um, the stabilization triangle then by Soklo and Pakla is broken down into a series of stabilization wedges so called and each of those wedges can be achieved by the implementation of a particular technology. The overall mission of the Soklo and Pakla um, work is to provide the global community with the confidence that we have at our fingertips the technologies with which we can achieve these emissions reductions that it's not a problem that's insurmountable and it's not a problem that will require new inventive technologies so the way to go about the stabilization of global emissions let's say at 450 ppm, but anyway stabilization is threefold. And I often refer to this as the, the three-pronged trident of climate mitigation. The first prong is um, to reduce demand. 
the second prong is to uh, increase efficiency and the third is to decarbonize supply so let me uh, illustrate that with this um, with this graph here where I have 100 kilowatts 100 kilowatt hours of electricity demand and that's all currently fed by fossil carbon if I were to attempt to decarbonize that the most I could hope to achieve would be a small amount perhaps so I have maybe in the UK there's perhaps 4% uh, or 5% of, of UK demand is met by green energy by, by low carbon or, or zero carbon energy not including nuclear energy and so clearly the um, the scale of demand reduction is it, it, the scale of decarbonization that's required is is much much larger than the capacity for societies to meet that demand simply by decarbonizing the supply and decarbonizing means using non-fossil energy for energy production and at this point I'm just going to pause the video and, and alter the light level because I, I sense that my UK climate uh, it's it's coming winter in the UK now so I'm just going to pause switch the lights on and come back to you okay welcome back hopefully that's a little bit brighter for you you can see me as I say it's it's coming winter here in the UK now and the uh, the nights are, are drawing in the days are getting shorter and shorter um, so back to the story here we have um, we have a mismatch a scale mismatch between the the potential for uh, energy supplies to be decarbonized and the extent to which we need to decarbonize so we're looking for solutions well the first solution is to reduce demand and here um, demand could be reduced typically in situations so <laughs> funnily enough thinking about lighting um, and here 100 kilowatt hours might be a typical light running for about a month in an office let's say um, so running eight hours a day or perhaps um, or, or so um, in an office environment typically demand reduction could be uh, achieved by about 60 percent of the demand could be reduced by simply managing the lighting in such a way that it was that light was used only when it was required uh, i've just switched the lights on here uh, because it was getting dim but they could have been on all day of course even though the light level in the room was fairly um, was fairly good for the majority of the day but I've, I've turned the lights on now that's that's demand reduction in, in many situations where demand is unmanaged completely then then it's not unusual to be able to see 40 percent or so reductions in in demand simply by intelligent uh, management of of demand so that's got us close to where we want to be the next um, the next prong on our trident is is to increase energy efficiency so now instead of using incandescent light bulbs I've reduced the demand by 40 percent and I'm now going to increase the efficiency by using compact fluorescent bulbs and that gets me down to to around about 10 or 12 percent uh, 10 or 12 kilowatt hours to do to deliver the same amount of lighting and you can see now that the the, um, the proportion of the energy that I'm using, the proportion of that energy that is um, that is delivered by renewables is much larger, which means that if I simply double my uh, my decarbonized supply, I, I get a much higher rate of decarbonization in my energy demand um, pattern. So this three-pronged approach to um, to managing the reduction in um, in this case in energy demand but of course ultimately in, in the reduction in emissions relies upon an intelligent approach in which demand is reduced so that there is less waste and less um, less consumption where it's not required followed by an increase in efficiency so this is typically technology technological um, and in, in Indeed, of course, demand reduction can also be managed technologically. And then ultimately, once you have uh, overall 
demands reduced through management of demand and energy efficiency increases, then the decarbonisation problem has become a lot smaller, and which means that the the realistic achievable decarbonisations have much more impact on the extent to which our energy demands are actually decarbonised. So how do we go about doing that? This is the achievement of, um, of our Sokolo Pakala wedges of course, what we want to do through, through this three-pronged approach is to deliver, um, deliver wedges into that um, stabilisation triangle so that by the mid-century we can be on a trajectory that looks much more like 450 ppm rather than business as usual. How do we go about demand reduction? Well, one way of, of, of achieving demand reduction is, is to change attitudes. So have people consume less, uh, less to consume less. On the one hand, less energy, but of course, as energy is embodied in everything that we consume, then the reduction in consumption equals a reduction in uh, in energy and consequently a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. However, demand reduction is a, a sensitive topic because it very much requires that attitudes change and attitudes are difficult to change in the sense that consumption is in many ways linked to um, aspects of self-identity and feelings or identity of self-worth and not only that but I think it's clear that the economic environment is such that demand is required of consumers. Um, in fact it's interesting to note in this respect that the, um, the economic system that we have broadly speaking is a linear one in which resources are taken from the environment, resources are then compiled into value-added products which consumers ultimately utilise until there is no value for the consumer left in that product, at which point the product is, is scrapped and the resources then enter the environment again. That linear kind of take-make-waste economy um, is is generalized and I think you can you can particularize that you can exemplify that by thinking about something for instance phosphate uh, fertilizers so we have um, a, a small number of large concentrated deposits of phosphate rock in the world those deposits are mined uh, the phosphate is, is removed and is incorporated into fertilizer products those fertilizer products are then, are then um, distributed around uh, around the world, spread onto, onto land, fertilizer phosphate enters the soil, enters the plant, enters the food chain, and enters water courses through interactions between the fertilizer and rainwater, and through the food chain also enters water courses. So ultimately, of course, those water courses then end up delivering the phosphate to the oceans, to the global oceans. So the, the economic um, activity is such that phosphate is taken from a concentrated resource and distributed into into the oceans in a in a very very diluted and and um, distributed way, and that I think it can be thought to be rather general of the action of of uh, our economic activity, which is to take resources and to through the use of or through the production of higher value products ultimately end up with um, with more distributed, higher entropy uh, outcomes. That makes demand reduction rather tricky as a, as a, as a problem because the economic, the economic environment that we find ourselves in, which is very good because it, it does a lot of wonderful things, reduce poverty, increase uh, human well-being and, and etc. But that, that economic environment is entirely designed or almost entirely designed around the concept of taking resources, making products and wasting resources, in which situation consumption is required. And the consumption meaning the removal of value from products that have had value added to them. 
So a deeper demand reduction is available to us if we follow this train of, of thought through. A deeper demand reduction is available to us by um, designing our products and ultimately our economy in such a way that resources are, main, are, are withheld within the economic system and aren't allowed to move out into the environment and to become more distributed, less concentrated, more wasted. So this is encapsulated in, in, sorts of, in the sorts of strategies within what's referred to as a circular economy. And these sorts of strategies would involve design for environment, for example, where products at the design stage are considered to, um, at the design stage, the impact on the environment is considered of that product. And design concepts such as modular, modularity and perhaps design for, um, for um, goods being able to be repaired or goods being able to be um, um, exchanged and, and re, um, reworked so they work again. These sorts of design strategies are at the heart of this deep demand reduction which looks towards an economy that rather than being linear take make waste becomes much more circular where as resources enter the economy from the environmental resource base those resources are allowed to circulate almost infinitely round the economy rather than spilling out through consumption into, into waste. Those sorts of demand reductions and of course I'm driving here at the fact that consumer objects contain embodied energy and that embodied energy represents embodied carbon emissions so such a demand reduction is capable of delivering some, some significant um, climate impact reductions and these deep demand redu reduction um, strategies that involve design are possible but it is possible using those strategies to circumvent the difficulties of ordinary de de uh, demand reduction so we no longer if we have clever design cleverly designed objects we no longer need to require consumers to feel impoverished or that they have their choice or their personal identity compromised by uh, increased efficiencies or increased environmental sustainabilities as far as consumers are concerned the situation can carry on as normal but the designers have made their products such that let's say when, you, when your mobile phone comes to the end of its life instead of you trashing it and getting a new mobile phone that mobile phone circuitry perhaps is recoverable or the, the, the rare earth metals involved in that mobile phone circuitry might be might be recoverable, etc. And, and so the utility is retained, but the, um, the, the demand on the environment that is embodied in that consumer object is, is dramatically reduced. Um, some examples that Soklo and Pakla give of demand reduction go like this. I've put these in red because these are ones that aren't currently implemented, but it's possible that we could implement them. So driving to billion cars half as far each year that would be one way of, of achieving a single sockel of pakala wedge you can appreciate that that de that sort of simple demand reduction has a, an impact on 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 consumer behavior and therefore requires a sort of behavioral change this attitude change which which perhaps is is less realistic than than deep demand reduction through design Electricity, domestic electricity use cut by 25%. Again, you can appreciate that asking people to turn everything down by a factor of one quarter or turning everything off to a factor of one quarter of time is, is potentially um, unachievable because of the conflict that that would have with people's attitudes. Nonetheless, both of these two strategies are technologically perfectly feasible. Uh, and finally, on this, um, on this issue, um, that demand reduction could be achieved through a complete stop of deforestation. So a single sockle or pakala wedge um, achieved by, by deforestation and a single wedge achieved by low tillage farming. 
the wedges that are um, that are possible through uh, increased efficiency look like this. So increased fuel economy of cars from 30 to 60 mpg, technologically feasible currently. If all cars had their uh, fuel efficiency uh, increased in this way, then there would be a, a single Tokolo-Pakolo wedge. So maybe one twelfth, one fifteenth of the um, of the of the triangle would be made up from that increased economy of cars. Implementation of combined heat and power generation and the implementation of complex, compact fluorescent lighting are in white here because those technologies are partially in place and could easily be uh, rolled out uh, globally through the, the right sorts of um, the right sorts of policy instruments at government level. So those two are in white. They each achieve a single uh, wedge within the stabilization triangle. Increased efficiency of power generation from 40 to 60 percent, and that that goes along with combined heat and power generation. And the implementation of carbon and capture, carbon capture and storage, all would deliver. Each would deliver a single wedge within the stabilization triangle. So this is really to build up a picture that under these three prongs of uh, of uh, carbon mitigation, we have at our fingertips the technologies available, although not necessarily implemented or implementable, but certainly technologically feasible routes to um, to achieving these Sokolopakla wedges. For uh, decarbonised energy supply, there's an 80-fold increase in wind power, a 700-fold increase in solar power, or, and or a doubling of nuclear power capacity globally. Each one of those would achieve uh, an SP wedge within the stabilisation triangle. So you see within this uh, Sokolo-Pakla um, picture, each of these stabilisation triangles represents one of those technologies. There are many other technologies that have been proposed that could formulate a single wedge. And so the, the message that comes from the Sokolopakla um, analysis is that to move from our business as usual line to our stabilization at 450 ppm line is technologically feasible. We start in early days with small amounts of change and incrementally grow each change year by year, such that at the end of the uh, the period to 2050, each of those triangles represents, each of those wedges represents a gigaton of carbon emission saving. So we see that greenhouse gas levels therefore must achieve a steady state, uh, by which I mean that the emissions of greenhouse gases must be such that the system, the global system, can respond and keep greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere stable. Currently we see the system is unable to respond in that way because emissions are increasing year on year. So as system responses move to, to catch up and to stabilise the concentration, there's an, an, an exponential increase in, in emission and so concentrations in the atmosphere continue to increase and importantly we do have the technology to, sol to solve this problem and if we approach the problem in a piecemeal way as um, as indicated by the Sokola-Pakola um, analysis then this is an achievable this is an achievable goal so a little bit of a recap at this stage we've seen so far that we do need to present to prevent the surface temperature from getting too high uh, and too high means well nobody's really sure but something above two degrees C increase compared to pre-industrial levels this requires that we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and therefore we need to have strategies to do that we must have ultimately the ability for the system to achieve a steady state in the greenhouse gas levels currently we're not at steady state we're on an increasing trajectory and we have the technology to do this. So this is in the context of, of this session being around the, the, the meeting the challenge of climate change. Well, there is a challenge. The temperature's going up, and that will drive climate. So we need to do something about greenhouse gas emissions, because that's what's driving the temperature increase. We 
Our aim is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. So we must stabilize at the moment they're increasing. We're not going to get back to pre-industrial levels soon. Um, so we need to just simply stabilize. Currently we're increasing, let's stop increasing. And then we have already, we have the technology to do that. So in terms of meeting the challenge, we can, if we clearly identify what the challenge is and then move ourselves globally as an international community towards achieving that, um, that aim. But here's a big but. Here's a gentleman, interesting chap, Stanley Jevons, a, a Scottish man um, who in 1865 noted that between 1930 and nine, uh, sorry, between 1830 and 1863, the production of coal became the the production of steel became more efficient in terms of its use of coal. As a result of that, the price of iron fell, and as a result of that, the demand for iron was stimulated so much so that production of iron increased. So, Jevons noticed what happens here, if you increase the efficiency by which, the energy efficiency by which you can make iron, you decrease the cost of iron, because it costs you less to make it, you pass that cost saving on to some extent to the consumer. The consumer then gets more hungry for iron, comes back for more, and you can increase the amount that you produce. He observed specifically that um, a, um, a reduction of coal consumption by one third led to a tenfold increase in consumption of coal within the industry. Within the industry, and that means within the iron production industry, and that's not counting the coal consumption that would have been increased as a result of whatever those iron products were going on to do within the economy, so secondary impact. So, for instance, you may have, uh, you may be producing iron to make railways. If you can produce iron more cheaply, then you'll make more railways. You'll therefore make more iron. Jevons uh, observed a tenfold increase for a one-third increase in um, efficiencies. So you make more railways, therefore you make more iron, therefore you, you burn less co more coal even though you're burning it more efficiently. However, you're also making railways, which use steam engines, which use coal. So there's a secondary economic effect also, that the impact that you have isn't just that you're making more stuff, it's that the stuff you're making is also demanding more energy in sort of further on down the economic chain. And Jevons summarised this in what has become known as the Jevons Paradox, and it's beautifully worded in his own writings because he was writing in a period of time when people used flowery language and uh, typically quite difficult to understand. So it's worth just spending a little bit of time on this. It's a confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of fuel is equivalent to diminished consumption. So he's saying it's a confusion of ideas, it's wrong thinking. If you think that economical use of fuel, so increasing the efficiency with which you use fuels, will lead to using less fuel. If you think that you will use less fuel because you're using it more efficiently, you're wrong. If you think using less fuel results from increased fuel efficiency, you're wrong. The very contrary is the truth. The opposite happens. If you make your system more fuel efficient, you use more fuel. This is the Jevons paradox. Modern economists refer to this effect as the rebound, the rebound effect. So as you make something more efficient, what happens is you stimulate the economy and you use more of that thing. So if we make our energy if systems more energy efficient, we end up using more energy. You can think of that, well, the Jevons paradox is a good way of thinking of that when you consider 
the, the, uh, the production of iron and steel and the production of railroads using that iron and steel. Therefore, um, the, the, as the cost of steel comes down, the cost of iron comes down, so you make more railroads and so you have more trains burning more coal. So there's a secondary effect. You can think of it also in terms of the household budget. I think if I were to increase my uh, the energy efficiency of my car, maybe I get a new car and it's more it's more energy efficient, more fuel efficient. I then find that I, I, I can drive just as far uh, for less money. So I might have more money in my bank account. And one thing I can do with that additional money is to drive a little further. So the the extent to which I have saved energy, save fuel in my car, I can I can buy that back some somehow. Use use more fuel because I've I've got I've got more money spare. And that, that's what economists call the rebound effect. And and the rebound effect really means that the saving that you have, let's say it's a one third saving in fuel efficiency, the spare cash that I have allows me to go further and uh, and, and use more fuel so I'll, 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 I'll spend some of that saving um, in, in more utility. What that means in terms of the rebound is that my, th my, my one third saving becomes less than a one third saving but actually in my household budget it's very unlikely that I'll drive that I'll, that I'll use more money than I already had in my budget so the fuel saving is unlikely to backfire as Jevons has pointed out in his paradox it's more likely that I'll just it'll rebound a little bit that I'll, I'll, I'll save a third but then I'll use a little bit more fuel because I've got more money and that's the rebound effect but if you allow that to, to operate throughout the economy so supposing I I'm, I've now got a more fuel efficient vehicle but it's not my family car it's maybe my business vehicle that might allow me to do more business miles, travel further, see more customers, do more business, and that uh, increase in, in economic activity will feed back into my business and I'll start producing more of whatever it is I make. And, and that overall increase in economic activity will lead to actually a positive increase in the extent to which I use energy, given a, a, an increase in energy efficiency. This has been studied by economists around the world for a number of years now. And there are some good examples of the rebound at work. Here's one search, which is the, the, the public road network lighting in the UK, the history of that from about 1920 up until the, the middle of, of the last decade of last century. And what you see here is that as the, um, as the so we've got a steady increase, this is the megawatt hours per mile, uh, a steady increase in, in the installed lighting but you see the the amount of of light that is is going in per mile starts to increase um, off the curve as this um, megawatt hours per mile curve starts to level off so we're getting more efficient in the amount of um, energy it takes to produce lighting so the the streets are becoming lighter and the overall effect of that is to drive energy demand for street lighting up and similarly through the uh, US economic history from 1880 to 1970 we could see that uh, energy consumption overall grew even though the efficiency the energy efficiency of the economy uh, was increased so this last line there on the slide is exactly the Jevons paradox in operation we're seeing that as the economic uh, machinery of the US increased its efficiency over that more or less one century it, it also because the um, the economy itself grew then also the energy consumption grew so really what's happening there is the the consum the, the, the economic growth is is outstripping is going faster than the efficiency increases what about demand reduction does that rebound well there are growing signs that, that it does and what that means is that if you were able to um, reduce the demand for energy so you might convince some uh, constituency 
in the world that they should use less energy uh, and that's happening in many um, in many developed economies people are becoming increasingly aware that that demand reduction is, is a positive environmental and social uh, good and, and so people will go to some extent to, to sacrifice uh, their own economic utility by having some voluntary demand reduction activities um, on themselves. What happens there though is that then that reduces actually the cost of energy in a supply and demand balance. So if, if fewer people want energy, the cost will go down because demand has gone down. As the cost goes down, consumers at the margin who weren't using so much energy will see cheaper energy prices. They'll come more into the market. And if they're doing economic activity with that energy, then, then there's the, the possibility for that to ramify through the economy and produce a rebound or Jevons paradox backfire. So there's evidence, growing evidence, that demand reduction will, um, will create a rebound effect. Okay. Why does this matter? For some reason I'm trying to be contacted by my people, but they can wait. Um, why does this matter? Okay. Apologies there, a bit of a glitch with my um, my people trying to get in touch with me. Took the system down a little bit. Um, so I'll, I'll restart from where I was. I was asking the question, why does this matter? And this matters because the Kyoto Protocol um, is, is based upon limiting global emissions, absolute global emissions. Now, some countries, notably the US, haven't signed up to Kyoto because they have made the argument that it's not required that we should limit our absolute emissions, rather it's required that we, or it is sufficient, that we limit our um, emissions intensity. So effectively looking at the, the argument is that if you look at the amount of greenhouse gases that you emit, you're looking at the wrong thing. You should look at the, um, the efficiency of your economy and that instead of capping emissions, we should limit inefficiency. So this argument is one that's been made by, by the key uh, economies that, that failed to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, failed to get on board with the international effort to make, um, to make the impact of climate change as low as possible. So that is a problem because um, if an economy becomes more efficient, it is argued by, for instance, the US, then it will if it emit less carbon. But we know by looking at, at for instance, the, the Jevons paradox and its modern ramifications or its modern incarnation as, as the rebound effect, we know that if you, if you increase efficiency, you don't necessarily reduce energy consumption. In fact, it's quite likely that you will increase energy consumption as a result of, of, um, of increasing efficiency. And therefore, if you increase energy efficiency and if you increase carbon efficiency, you are likely to increase carbon emissions. And here we can see this graph shows exactly that for the US over the period 1994 to 2004. The, the, the blue line here is, a, is showing a reduction in the carbon intensity of gross domestic product in the US. So the US is getting increasingly more efficient at producing uh, economic good, uh, more efficient in terms of the amount of carbon it produces per unit of economic good. Yet, during the same period, the actual absolute emissions of carbon dioxide increased. And again, this tells the story that although there is an increase in efficiency in the economy, the economic growth is larger than the increase in efficiency. So the overall effect is an increase in emissions. This is important because we, um, we need a strategy to, we need to know what we, can, what we have to limit, what we have to target in order to effectively manage the transition into this period 
of, of uh, increasing climate change. We can't use temperature. We can't say let's leave. Let's let's aim to not have a two degree C rise or not have a three degree C rise because temperature lags behind the driver, the greenhouse gas emission driver for climate change. So if you limit yourself to well, let's stop emitting when the temperature hits two degrees, it, you're too late because there's more climate change coming at you in a way that you can't predict. And we can't use increases in efficiency as, um, as a tool to manage global emissions or global climate change because of the rebound effect. So this means as a fifth sort of principle that we're driving at in this session that we need to, uh, we need to um, have emissions reduction strategies that relate to absolute limits of greenhouse gas concentrations. It's insufficient to say let's become more efficient at the way we use carbon. It's absolutely necessary to say we need to limit the amount of carbon dioxide, the amount of greenhouse gas that we're emitting. Not to say let's become more efficient at emitting, but say let's get, actually let's emit less. But that's not fair. Because there are many economies in the world say, look, we haven't had the chance, um, we're in a development phase, we haven't had the richness and the economic benefits that come from uh, burning all these fossil fuels and, and stimulating loads of economic activity and generally increasing the, the state of well-being, health uh, and, and, um, and general goodness within the economy that the developed economies have had. And so if the developed economies are to impose globally some sort of limit on carbon dioxide emissions, given that carbon dioxide emissions come from energy, and energy is what stimulates economies, then that leaves the developing economies of the world at a significant disadvantage. The developed economies have reaped all the benefit of burning these fossil fuels and emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, generating a global problem, and now comes the time where emissions are capped or limited and then the emerging economies say, well, we can't compete because it's impossible for us now to, to, um, to emit carbon because the system's already weakened. So there's a significant difficulty in terms of the international political environment. One solution to that is to develop the contract and converge methodology in which um, global economies that are developing are allowed to increase their emissions and global economies that are developed are required to decrease their emissions strongly such that the average global absolute emission reaches a target level. So you allow um, emerging economies to, to uh, expand and increase their emissions and you mandate that the developed economies contract their uh, emissions such that the, there is a, a convergence as the, as, the, uh, as the developed economies contract and the developing economies expand their emissions, they converge upon this magic number of the cap in global emissions. So the, so the solution here under the contract and converge scenario is to have a binding global emissions limit which is composed of individually locally implemented separate emissions limits which may allow economies perhaps to expand their emissions or other economies mandated to contract their emissions. This concept of contract and converge represents the, the um, or reflects the principle of equity that's built into the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, th this concept that, that it, it isn't fair for developing economies to face a developmental burden because of the environmental burden that's been placed upon them by the development of the already advanced economies. So contract and converge is a, a, is a solution to this uh, sort of international geopolitical problem that not all economies are at the same state of development. Development requires energy and the climate situation that we face is largely the inheritance from the development of the economies that lead the global economic uh, environment. So 
here's a, a famous equation now that's going to help us to unpack a little bit of um, of what we've been talking about and to just to lead us on to the final um, few notes within this session and it, it's it's sometimes called the master equation sometimes referred to as the IPAT equation or often the Ehrlich equation after after Ehrlich the, 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 the researcher who first um, formulated the equation I is equal to PAT uh, where I is equal to environmental impact uh, impact is equal to the product of population affluence and technology population being simply that number of people affluence being the amount of um, money each person on average in the population has so that's essentially per capita GDP and technology being the environmental impact that arises per unit of GDP creation so this is a very um, a very powerful model equation by which we can understand the mechanisms through which environmental impact occurs and what we've seen uh, up till now has been looking at the at the right hand side of that equation we've been saying we've been thinking about how we might uh, uh, how we might address the challenge of climate change we've understood implicitly I think throughout this uh, session although we haven't mentioned it the population is a is a, a limit that that we feel I think as a global community is an unreasonable policy area to to engage in it doesn't seem a reasonable or palatable uh, response to climate change to to in to enact limits on population growth affluence I think we see that globally um, affluence is, is at the heart of development and sustainability that we we require and demand that every person living on the planet should achieve a particular baseline level of, of affluence such that they can enjoy a happy, well-educated, um, well-resourced and, um, and and healthful life. So this leads us now into the technology spheres, the only sphere we really have with which we can change the impact that we have on the environment. And up till now we've really talked about um, technology in terms of reducing the impact that we have on the environment by, um, as we saw with the Sokolo Pakala wedges, a, a raft of technologies that we could employ, whether it's decarbonized supply or whether it's increased efficiencies through generation of, of interesting new technologies like compact fluorescent light bulbs, a decarbonized supply might come through solar power technology or whatever. There's a, a, a raft of, of technological um, solutions, both existent and that we might imagine could exist that will reduce this technology term so reduce the environmental impact of each unit of GDP so this is a great equation because you can see through this you allowed GDP to increase which is widely understood to be a good thing you allow population to do what it wants which again is widely understood to be a good thing and incidentally it is well understood in terms of population dynamics that as affluence increases then populations tend to stabilize and so one way to stabilize global populations is to let affluence increase so GDP growth should stabilize population growth and we have robust population forecasts for the coming century um, so technology it is the role of technology in this IPAT model to reduce the impact of individual elements of GDP creation. Now, we've already discussed that the fly in the ointment of that storyline, that the, the, the problem or the challenge that exists within that uh, solution is, is rebound, that as you increase the, um, the, the, the efficiency of the economy, you increase the economic activity and growth will outstrip in some cases will outstrip the, um, the savings that you've made that said we've through this brief look at the IPAT equation we've certainly localized the um, the response to the challenge of climate change we've localized the response in the dimension of technology so it's about making GDP creation more economic, more environmentally efficient. 
However, we see that impact is increasing, that if we make our economy more efficient at making GDP, making money for less impact, we may have rebound effects on that, so we might not be as efficient as we think we're being. Worst case scenario, we may become less efficient as we become more efficient, perversely, and that's the Jevons paradox. So we've localised in technology, and we've seen technology to, to increase efficiencies, but it is arguable. It will also be possible to have a series of technologies which address in absolutely directly address the left-hand side of the equation, the impact that we're having on the environment. And these are the technologies that are sort of geoengineering technologies, that as we get um, increasingly affluent, increasingly populous world with technologies that are increasingly um, energy efficient, we still have impacts that may be driving global climate into territory that is difficult to predict and potentially has dire consequences, the territory above 2 degrees C rise. So we may well need technologies that simply remove carbon dioxide from the air or simply remove radiative forcing, so sort of reflect sunlight or in some other way prevent the temperature from increasing. So there, are, there is the potential within the discussion that we're developing in this session, there is the potential to, to recognise the need for geoengineering solutions to deliver at least part of the Sokola-Pakola um, strategy. And there we have the sort of um, geoengineering um, solutions that are, that are being discussed currently and, and the removal of carbon from the atmosphere. Geoengineering is uh, range the, the technologies that are that are um, discussed within the context of geoengineering range from the mundane to the to the fairly sublime. So there are um, ideas to put large mirrors in space to reflect sunlight, or to seed clouds so that there is more al planetary albedo that reflects sunlight. Perhaps to build artificial trees that capture carbon dioxide or to have large pumps that, that bring carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in one way or another. Um, other ways to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere will involve um, using biomass and somehow locking biomass away so that it's um, you, you let photosynthesis do the work of capturing carbon and then you just you interrupt the carbon cycle which would automatically normally return that carbon to the atmosphere. So there are a number of technologies on the table and in discussion and, and in development that the, um, the human technological endeavour has uh, access to that can be mobilised and implemented as and when necessary and some aspects of the debate will identify that um, there may come a time where we need to have rapidly implementable, strongly effective geoengineering solutions in the event of rapid excursions from what we regard as ordinary climate. So this is here for completeness, really. It's not, um, it, it, it's not reasonable to, to conclude this discussion of the, um, the, the international approaches to the problem of climate change without also considering the, the necessity or the potential necessity for geoengineering solutions and for the direct removal of carbon from, uh, from the atmosphere using um, advanced or less advanced technological means. So it is, it is those means by which we will meet the, the challenge of climate change. So in summary then, I want to just review some of the, the main points that we've seen. We, we started off by seeing that the, we, we really need to prevent surface temperature from getting too high. And I, I think there's a very strong international consensus that that statement is true. There is still debate around what is meant by too high. And the debate is focusing more uh, is focusing increasingly on the concept that 2 degrees C of increased temperature relative to pre-industrial temperatures is too high. For To achieve this, we will need to um, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions because our aim 
in stabilizing temperature is to stabilize greenhouse gas levels which are currently increasing exponentially as a result of human economic activities. We have seen that few good there is a technological solution or there are technological solutions to this problem we have a portfolio of technologies which if implemented would achieve realistic carbon reductions um, in the face of the sorts of climate change that we consider likely so we can solve the problem and actually it's not a technological problem it's a political and economic problem as to whether uh, individual governments or governments organized at a global level will um, be able to implement the institutions and to spend the, the, the taxpayer revenue that would be required to implement the technologies that would be required to achieve a steady state carbon in the atmosphere. Emission reduction strategies um, that would be the measure of success in this aim would need to have absolute limits on greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, not relative um, efficiencies at the heart of the uh, reduction strategy because of rebound effects. So you can't say let's make our economy 90% more carbon efficient or 50% more carbon efficient because the, the potential exists for you to uh, become increasingly efficient but to grow beyond those increases in efficiency and, and therefore generate more carbon emissions even though you're doing it more efficiently. To solve that problem it is absolutely necessary that the, the measure that is taken uh, for reduction is an absolute measure, so tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And um, finally it is likely, probable, that there will need to be also either physical removal mechanisms for carbon for greenhouse gases or other geoengineering solutions. So those six points really are at the summary of the, um, the strategy that the global community has by which it can meet the, the challenge, the serious challenge of global climate change. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you for listening and um, I hope you uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the course. Thank you.